Yeah, opening the spell of the Sportsman Zone with cricket. West Indies showed a bit of fight on the opening day of the first test, but hosts Australia maintained the upper hand at stumps at the Adelaide Oval. Jamaican Kurt McKenzie with bat and debutant Shamar Joseph with both bat and ball were the impressive performers for the Caribbean side on day one. Gerard Morrisili has the recap. Over 20,000 fans packed into the Adelaide Oval as Australia made a surprising decision to send the Caribbean side to bat. Captain Craig Brathwaite and Tejan Raishanapal, the first to face up to a superb Aussie lineup. Neither batsman survived a Pat Cummins work over though. Shanapal, the first to go, well caught by Cameron Green for six. Before Brathwaite's defence was breached by the Aussie captain to leave the Windies at two for 27. Dominique and Alec Atene survived a few close calls while leaving alone, but totally misjudged this one, giving Josh Hazelwood a milestone scalp. 250 test wickets for Josh Hazelwood. Oh, that's a shame. He's been playing well. And he's just misjudged it a little bit. Jamaican Kirk McKenzie in only a second test was the dominant force in a 46-run fourth wicket stand with Kevin Hodge. Having taken the Windies to lunch at three for 64, McKenzie and struck the ball sweetly for seven boundaries to bring up a made in half century after lunch. Best on one of the very nicest. Yeah, well played. Hope sprung eternal, but Josh Hazelwood ripped through the Windies' middle order to finish with four for 44. While skipper Pat Cummins ended pick of the bowlers with four for four to one as the Windies slumped to 133 for nine, including losing six for 35. Shamar Joseph made a noteworthy entry to test cricket though. The 24-year-old Guyanese survived the hit to the helmet and counter-attacked with some vicious shots of his own. Alongside veteran Kimar Roach, they added 55 for the final wicket, the highest partnership of the day. Joseph, who struck three fours and a six in his 36 of 41 balls, was eventually last man out, leaving Roach unbeaten on 17 as the Windies were dismissed for 188. All eyes turned to Steve Smith in his maiden innings as an opener as the right-hander walked out alongside Usman Kawaja. The left-handed Kawaja had the first scare, but the wicketkeeper Joshua De Silva let him off the hook. Joseph understandably disappointed. You've got to hold your catches in Australia, and the first one has gone down. Oh, you can't believe it. That one there, 140 k's, 10 k's quicker. Gets the edge. Shamar Joseph had to wait eight overs before oh, Captain nice. Craig Brathwaite threw him the ball, but he only needed one delivery to make a mark, and it was a significant one. Amazing. Amazing. First delivery in Test cricket to create Steve Smith edges straight to second slip. Well, that will go on the record books for that young man, and what a start to his career. And one wicket would bring two for the speedster. Removing the dangerous minus Labu Shane for yes. 10. Um, I just went and built my mind, you know, to get the first ball right, just on top of off some. And that went for good for me there. You know, and getting Steve Smith wicket is just amazing for me. Australia ending the day on two for 59, trailing by 129 runs. All right, let's have a look at the full scorecard for the West Indies on the opening day of this test match. A number of batsmen actually getting starts in the encounter um, and then being unable to push on in this one. Brathwaite, 13, Chandapal, 6, Mackenzie batting at 3, getting a half century. Athenes got 13 from 31 deliveries. Hodge got 12 from 36. Grace didn't hang around for too long. 5 from 9. The Silver Face, 22 deliveries for his 6. Alzari Joseph, 21 deliveries for his 14. And the Aussies, led by Hazelwood and Cummings, they used six bowlers in dismissing the West Indies for 188 in 62.1 overs. And they gave away 15 extras. The extras getting into double figures as well, like a number of the Windies batsmen. Let's now get the thoughts of our captain. Fazir Mohammed, as you see there, the Australians finishing on 2 for 59. Fazir Mohammed, welcome to the Sportsmax Zone. It's great to have you once again. I guess we have to start with uh, Shamar Joseph and his impressive debut performance, taking on the Australian bowlers after he was smacked on the helmet 
and then delivering with ball as well to give the West Indies a little bit of impetus at the end of day number one. Your assessment of his effort. Well, well really, um, forgive the cliche, but this is what dreams are made of. If you really think about it, not only do you feature in a 55-run stand, scoring 36, belting sixes and fours, but then the, the, the icing on the cake is to get the wicket with your first ball, and not just any old wicket, but the wicket of the premier batsman in the Australia team, one of the premier batsmen in the world in the modern generation, and you follow that up, we're getting the next most prolific batsman in the Australian side with a short ball top edge to fine leg. So really, uh, he's, he's probably floating still, even with an, an hour and a bit to go to the start of day two, but he's got like the rest of his teammates to have their feet planted firmly on the ground at the start of day two to ensure that the West Indies can really carry on from this very encouraging effort. But no question about it, Shamar Joseph, by a long, long way, the star of day one. Yeah, your assessment of his bowling effort and the areas he was able to hit consistently that made him a wicket-taking threat where we might not have seen that necessarily, um, well, not on a consistent basis, even though the bowling attack was disciplined generally, but we might not have seen that consistent threat from the others. And I think he pointed that out at the end of the day, just hitting that off stump line. It, it, it gets pretty tedious making these statements, and I'm sure many would hear it from the commentators as well, the right areas, the right areas, and so on. But really, it stands the test of time. Look at the bowling of Hazelwood. It's not particularly spectacular, but he's there, thereabouts, on off stump every single time. And Shamar Joseph followed suit uh, that delivery where he got Steve Smith. You could probably argue, well, okay, it was wider off. He didn't have to play. But that's not how the game is played. In the flow of things, it's almost natural for a, for a batter to follow the ball, a bit of seam movement, good edge. He's not extreme express pace. He's not a Michael Holding or a Fidel Edwards, for example, but he's in the high 80s, which is good enough. And then to use the short ball sparingly, you don't want to indulge too much. You don't want to make it seem that you're telegraphing a short ball every other delivery or twice in and over. And he used that short ball to Labuschagne perfectly uh, positioned. He went for the hook shot, the top edge to find a like, good catch taken by Moti. So, so really, you're seeing quite a few tools already in the young man's armory. But again, at, at, at the risk of sounding, I wouldn't say pessimistic, but cautious, he will have to recognize that that was just day one. This is test match cricket. It's not a T20, it's not a one international. There's a day two and maybe a day three and four to come where if he's required, as I'm sure he will be at the start of day two, to really hit his straps from ball one like everyone else. Yeah, and I want to get your thoughts quickly as well on Kurt McKenzie, who top scored for the West Indies. Um, we had suggested that maybe he was the one who would have been left out of the 11 as it turned out he played and he produced a good knock. There was a little disappointment for me, Faz, because I felt there was a hint of relaxation when he got to the half century and then nicked one. And I would have loved to see him carry on. But truth be told, it was a good half century. I'm glad you brought that up because, yes, I did drop him for, for, for this 11, and he responded with the half century. I also said that Australia, without doubt, would, would back first on winning the toss, and they didn't, which is a rarity at Adelaide over the last 30 years. So, yes, uh, we need to point out when we get it wrong. But, again, Mackenzie showed the tools, and the same way when he got 32 in his debut innings at Queen's Park Oval against India last July, Clearly, he is someone with something that you, you want to see him build on. And you're right. In the same way I spoke about Alec Athenes not so long ago, seeming to relax mentally when he got into the 40s or got past 50, I would like these young men, if we're talking test cricket, to go back to the early days of West Indies in test cricket and see a certain name, a fellow Jamaican, when we're talking about Kirk McKenzie, George Headley. He didn't settle for 50s. He got hundreds. He got big hundreds, even though the West Indies were losing. He was the atlas of West Indies batting. And therefore, I would like to see these young players try to emulate that and, to, and get greedy. Become selfish if you have to be, because that is what is necessary for their own growth and to be able to pull the team along with them. Yeah, and speaking about pulling the team along with them, Faz, yesterday on the show, we spoke... Um, very long about the importance of Craig Brassweight and Tej Narayan Chandapal, the openers for this Windies setup. 
of course, you know, they were only able to bat for 10 overs and they were dismissed. Your thoughts on how they went about their business? I thought they did the best that they could. Uh, lasting them for, for 40 minutes, uh, again, because Australia felt the conditions were so bowler-friendly that they were going totally against the grain in choosing to bowl first. And, and yes, there would be some elements of luck playing and missing along the way. But in the end, and again, again this is important to note, it's about setting the standard for the day. Look at what happened when the first attacking shot was played. Tate Narayan Chandapal slicing high to a wide third slip and Cameron Green pulls down an excellent catch. Compare that with the start of the Australian innings when Joshua De Silva missed a chance diving to his left, yes, but one that he should have held comfortably. And this is what sets the standard. This is why fielding is so important in the game of cricket, in any format, because you lift your team almost immediately. When you see a catch taken like that, and indeed, the Aussies were brilliant in the field throughout the course of the West Indies innings. So, so yes, an opening stand, encouraging bits and pieces, but from the moment he played an attacking shot, he was snaffled up. And, and again, that sets the tone, and it's so important for the West Indies to ensure they set the tone themselves at the start of day two. Right, you spoke about that Joshua De Silva dropped catch. Of course, you know, a lot of analysts saying that that was a catch that, you know, they felt as if it was so easy and they expected him to get. Uh, did you notice any other areas fast that you know there were misfielding that needs to be rectified if we are to put up a fight whatsoever moving forward not much in terms of errors in the fielding but i, I just want and, and i'm sure this is the message that andrew coley will be sending to the west indies team and the rest of the support staff brian lara who's a commentator but also a mentor uh, to this west indies team reminding them that in test match cricket it's not good enough to have one good session or one good day it's because it's test match cricket, you have to be locked in and switched on all the time. Because you may not win a test match in one session, but you could definitely lose a test match because you could fall so far behind that it's difficult to make up that lost ground. So yes, Joshua De Silva dropped a catch, which he should have taken. He went too far across, hit him on the heel of the hand, and it fell out. He should have taken that. But now on day two, you try to put that behind you and ensure that the next edge that comes you grab it. The next opportunity that comes that you grab, you set a standard that shows that the West Indies are baby underdogs, huge underdogs, undermanned, may lose the test match anyway, may lose the series 2-0, but there's more than just a little bit of fight and a bit of character if they can show that determination at the start of day two. Yeah, Faz, yesterday on the show, I did suggest that although there are so many inexperienced players in the West Indies team, um, one plus factor that you could put into the equation is that because they are new and because they are such huge underdogs, they may not put themselves under as much pressure as maybe a player who had been playing for, for a longer period. And I was intrigued by the post-play comments by Shamar Joseph. He said he played with no fear. And that is what I was trying to get at. As a new player, um, you know, he, he, could, he could relax and play as freely as he could. And he did that, both with bat and ball. Absolutely. And we saw the positive side of it. And, and therefore, you've got to recognize that that element of, of confidence and no fear can be a double-edged sword. Yes. Uh, we saw Justin Graves, a poor shot driving to short extra cover. Uh, we, we, show, we saw the, the, the others in the middle order with their relative inexperience showing a bit of promise, a few decent shots along the way, but then getting out. So it's important, as you said quite correctly, Lance, to play with confidence. You're in test match cricket. You don't, as we said a couple of days ago, play to lose. You, you play anticipating that you're going to take on the Australians. And that's why I made that reference to the late, great George Headley, that you tell yourself that, OK, no fair is fine. When the same way with Shamar Joseph, he should be telling himself, I got Steve Smith. I'm going to get three, four or five more before this Australian innings is over. You need to be hungry, you need to be greedy. You need to show that that fear is combined with a hunger and a desire and an appetite that can really sustain a test match effort. Yeah, on the other side of the coin though, Faz, I would still like to put the fact out there that as a, a tail ender, there wasn't as much pressure on Shamar Joseph to bat responsibly as some of the top order batsmen um, faced because I say that because there were some people who, who said that Shamar Joseph showed the top order men how, how to bat. 
But to be to be fair to the top order batsmen, if they had tried to play some of the shots that Shamar Joseph played and some of the ones he missed, um, I, I think they would be taken to task because their responsibility is a little bit different. Having said that, um, Shamar played splendidly, but his his posture as a, 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 a tail ender batsman isn't the same as the men batting in the top five, is it? There's no comparison, Lance, and, and it's unfair to make that comparison yes. uh, because, again, simply put, and then you said it correctly, some of the shots he played, if anyone in the top order had tried that and even got away with it or sliced it over slip, people would be asking, what is this guy doing in a West Indies test team? Look, look at that shot, for example. Of course, yes, off the middle of the bat, but no reputable top order, opening batter, middle order batter is going to play a shot like that and expect not to be chastised. So yes, there was that element of freedom. And yet again, we see Australia a bit vulnerable when it comes to getting that last wicket. This is the third time in 12 months that they have had to endure a, a last wicket partnership of over 50 runs in a test match. So, so that is something they have to work on as well. Maybe they're too defensive towards the end of an innings. And uh, again, that is why there's so much that is intriguing about Test Match Cricket. Yes, it might be struggling in many parts of the world, including right here in our part of the world. But when you see a day like yesterday and the discussion around it and the history around it, it tells you that it's, it's, it's only because people have been reckless and careless and really selfish in many ways that we find ourselves arguing about the survival of Test Match Cricket. Yeah, and just one thing before you go fast, you did reference earlier on Josh Hazelwood's um, bowling because he was hardly over 135k, but his accuracy faz, his his accuracy faz was 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 remarkable, and and that's the hallmark of his game. And it can appear quite boring to do that, you know, Lance. If you tell a young player, look, I just want you to aim to hit the top of of, of stump for the next 100 balls. I don't care what else you want to do. Next 100 balls, hit the top of off stump. Think of how difficult that is because there's always the temptation to try something different. Glenn McGraw was a master at it, which is why he saw so much success. But yes, repetition, metronomic is the term often used. It may not be exciting, but look at the rewards it brings. Yeah, the Aussie bowlers did a fabulous job of setting up quite a few of the West Indies batsmen in that first innings. Thanks very much, Faz, for chatting with us. So one of the things Faz pointed out, only the second captain, Pat Cummins, to, since 1992 to insert the opposition batting side at the Adelaide Oval. So that speaks to how shocking it was that the Aussies didn't bat first. But they are in control of the match still, 129 behind in the first innings. Let's go to a break. More to come on the Sportsman Zone after this.